Today on Hands On Photography, I'm going to sit down with Captain, Captain Nick Anderson, and we're going to talk pet photography because I know everybody out there has pets. It's where there's cats and dogs, and you always want to put those nice, cute, funny shots up on social media. Well, we have some tips for you from a real deal pro pet photographer, and he's going to walk you through how to make your shots stand out. Y'all stay tuned. This is Twit. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I'm Matt Pruitt, and this is Hands-On Photography here on Twit TV. Hope y'all are doing well. I am unbelievable as always. If this is your first time catching the show, I'm going to make you pause right now and then go ahead and hit subscribe and whatever podcast application you're enjoying us on because we're on all of the different services. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on Spotify. We're on whatever the heck Google uses for podcasts. If you're not sure, just head on over to our website, twit.tv slash hop. That's twit.tv slash H-O-P for hands-on photography. And you'll see all of our subscription options there. And you'll see all of our previous episodes and show notes and all of that good stuff in there. Because I actually get the opportunity to sit down and chat with some really, really fascinating photographers and really, really good photographers. And then there's people like this guy here, Mr. Nick Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're really scraping the barrel. Andy. <laughs> How you Lovely doing? to see you there. You're looking so cool there. I love it. I have my um, moments. I have my moments. You know, before excellent. we started, my my heart rate was up, so I'm I'm slowly trying to calm down so I can successfully do a podcast with you, Mister Nick Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> so long as there's lots of laughter, that's fine. And yeah, heart rates, uh, you know, good. Like like that. <laughs> bit of adrenaline i'll take it i'll take it but i'm glad to have you on i reached out to you because um i've been dabbling with with pet photography and you sir are a, a, a daggum veteran when it comes to pet photography and uh, you told me pre-show you've been doing this for about 10 years and Jeez, man, I, I can only imagine the wealth of knowledge and information that you're going to have on this subject, because pet photography is not as easy as one may think that it is. You see all of this stuff on Instagram of people sharing their cat photos and dog photos and, and stuff like that. But it's a big difference when there's someone like you, a true professional, sits down with their camera, regardless of what the camera is, and snaps and click that shutter. And it just just turns out to be in a, a beautiful piece of art so thank you for joining me today and thank you for agreeing to share some of your wonderful information and tips and tricks but I want to allow you the floor to you know tell everybody a little bit more about yourself and some of the things that you've been doing because you know last I heard is you just been chilling in this wonderful world called <laughs> retirement you know I, I wish chilling was <laughs> you know exactly what I have been doing but my life has become so full uh, mm -hmm. since I gave up my number one job I, and I, I'm gonna balk a little bit about being called a professional because you know in my book a professional actually makes their living uh, mm -hmm. photography and I've never been able to reach that level um, partly because I you know used to have another job and you can't really devote enough time to photography um, if you're trying to hold down two jobs uh, so I, I I sort of picked up cameras when I was about seven so mm -hmm. uh, I had a box brownie I think a lot of oh, wow. kids in my age uh, started off with a box brownie and uh, when I was uh, 18 19 uh, my girlfriend at the time who worked in a department store bought me uh, my first uh, single lens reflex and it had no light meter no nothing it was completely manual and I kind of taught myself yeah. but over the years I've, I've you know kept my interest in photography all the time I've got pictures of my flying career stretching back and for those who don't know then I was a, a Royal Air Force uh, fighter pilot for nearly 20 years and an airline pilot for 25 years but I think a, a hobby like photography can be so absorbing uh, that it takes you away from your professional life in another world so that it you know gives you a great way of, of um, relaxing and separating uh, and also there's a fantastic 
um, skill between the technology and the art of photography. And those two, for me, if you've got the right mind, I think they, they meld beautifully. Uh, and that's one of the things that attracted me to photography. It allowed me to express myself, and I really enjoyed the technical aspects as well. Man, see... You, you, you snuck something in there saying that your, you know, your primary career was not photography. Your primary career was freaking flying airplanes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And not just any yeah. airplane. You, you flew fighters at, at one point. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. In the Air Force, I, uh, I flew the F-4 Phantom, a beautiful American fighter. Uh, I flew the um, F-18 Hornet uh, oh. while I was working with the Australians for several years. And I flew the Tornado as well before I retired. You know, there comes a point when your body is, <laughs> isn't is quite up to being <laughs> beaten up every day. So uh, yeah, uh, I moved on to civil flying and then had a lovely um, career with uh, Virgin Atlantic flying a long haul all around the world. And um, uh, luckily, it was uninterrupted, really, by many of the things that have caused other people's careers to come to a grinding halt, right. like 9-11 and uh, right. more recently, the pandemic. Uh, so uh, I, I was one of the lucky ones. I really only had two jobs, the Royal Air Force and uh, my civil flying. But always, always in the background, there was my photography. I always had a camera in my bag. And I've got um, pictures from all around the world of my uh, travels, as well as uh, aircraft and lots of um, you know, air to air shots, air to ground shots, that kind of stuff. So I, wherever I've gone, I've always practiced photography. But I decided that I was going to try and make a little bit of pin money so that I could mm -hmm. afford to buy the latest equipment. So <laughs> about 10 years ago, I decided to uh, turn commercial and start selling my images. And the, I thought of a, try to think of a niche that I could get into uh, mm -hmm. that perhaps wasn't too overcrowded with other photographers. Right. And that niche I found initially was gun dogs, more specifically the breed of dog that I own, which is the Hungarian Wiesler. And um, okay. there are an awful lot of these dogs around and uh, if you know the breeders and know the owners uh you know it's quite easy to make uh, to network and find customers who are looking for that kind of special photograph um that um uh, you know really does give them a wonderful memory of their pet or their working dog because i right. also specialize in working dogs so all right you you found your your niche and you decided to to you know to go out and network and you meet meet up with people and say hey let's do a, a project together and they agree and you head out to the site to start shooting and and what what is your thought process because when I think about trying to shoot a a dog for a photograph I think about the dog's nuance the dog is going to be running around possibly or just sitting there not interested possibly or maybe a little bit too um, too happy and just sort of giddy and won't sit still and then there's the other elements as far as just the environment itself there's a lot of different variables right there to 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 get everything squared away for that one shot what is your process of you know of going in and saying hey this is how we're going to do this shot this is uh this is the scene we want or or is it a little bit of give and take between you and the model well, well a lot of it depends on the customer's brief so it, if they want a studio shot i, I can do a studio shot mm -hmm. uh, it's not a problem you have to think a little bit about light positioning because your subject is probably only two or three foot tall so you uh, you bring to bring those lights down but once you've you've realized that you're going to be shooting very close to the floor um, then you know light setup is very similar to any kind of uh, um, indoor you know studio shop uh, mm -hmm. you you use the same soft lights you use the same uh, umbrellas you perhaps put a hard light on you think of your backgrounds do you want to 
uh, have the similar color to the fur and use shadow to bring them out or do you want to have a complete contrast so you, you go through that and you talk about it with your customer and then it, it quite honestly it's the easiest kind of pet photography because all you do got to do is make sure the dog's had a good walk in the morning so that it's got a bit of its energy out and you just come in and you spend time setting up and you let the dog relax in the environment you spend half an hour perhaps just randomly firing the lights chatting to the owner chatting to the dog sitting on the floor with it until it feels completely comfortable with this new equipment that's around then you position the dog and it, a lot of this depends on how well the owner has trained their animal mm -hmm. so if if the dog won't even sit you've got a bit of a problem <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know a few treats few toys things to engage with uh, and uh, quite honestly I don't think you'd be very good as a pet photographer you didn't have a real feeling for animals and uh, be able to um, communicate with them you know at, at an eye level so that you can right. engage with them you can attract their eye you can ask them to do something you can make a funny noise that generates a reaction you want um, but to be absolutely truthful and um, studio work is is not my thing i, I mm -hmm. much prefer to let the dog do what it would do naturally so going out on a walk is ideal uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you go out for a walk for two or three hours, I know that in two or three hours, I can come back with 80 or 100 really good quality images of that dog that show it in almost every character. But once you're out with it, then you've really got to start thinking about what the dog's going to do. You've got to be one step ahead because, particularly if it's a fast breed like yeah. a greyhound or a Vistler, which is an extremely fast breed uh, you've got to know where it's going to emerge. if it's dived into the bushes you've got to have a good idea of where it's going to emerge you've got to have your camera up you've got to have the right settings on your camera so that you as it comes out of a bush or something or it looks up out of some ferns <laughs> then you've got to be right there to capture it a lot of that is anticipation and a lot of that is uh practice and experience so i i used to go out for oh, so many times with my dogs for a walk and my camera mm -hmm. come back and analyze my shots and decide what i'd done wrong and why i hadn't got that shot right why the focus had been off etc etc mm -hmm. so a lot of it really you've got to know a little bit about the breed or preferably a lot about the breed but mm -hmm. if it's your own dog that should be okay you should know your you should own know dog your pretty dog. well yeah and you should know its habits you should know how far it goes away before it turns around and comes back and checks on you right and that's the point at which you have the camera up because you don't want a picture of the dog's backside as it's no. running down a path <laughs> but what you want to do is you think well my dog usually goes 30 yards and then it turns around and it looks at me uh, perhaps sometimes over its shoulder just to check and that's such an endearing shot quite often right so you think to yourself it's getting to the limit now you have your camera up ready focused and the moment it turns to look you capture it looking straight at you as it just checks on you right. and then it goes about its business that and there are so many of those little moments that will occur while you're moving around with a with a dog uh, and it, once you learn to catch them all then you will come back with a portfolio you know and it, it's interesting you talk about the contrast of being in the studio versus outside and with the lighting and things of that nature because just recently I was goofing around with my little tiny dog Biscuit, one of the dogs, and decided, you know what, let's let's just do a little shoot with Biscuit and I put him up on my stand and grab some lights and I said, hmm, I probably shouldn't put strobes in here so I just set up a constant light and because I figured setting up a strobe and it flashing is just going to be a bit of a distraction and maybe freak them out, quite honestly. Um, so I went with the a constant light and that shot still came out pretty daggum bad because it's just I, I, it's it's a tough task to get the dog to sit still and, and try to train them to focus. And, and you know, because as they're moving around, any little micro movements can be picked up as motion blur and you'll lose yeah. the focus. What, what, on it. Uh, what shutter speed have you decided on? I believe on that shot, it was like one one twenty fifth, I think. Yeah. If, if you if 
you know, Canon rarely goes above uh, a two hundredth with uh, studio strobe. Mm -hmm. So if you can use a two hundredth, better still. But it's one of the reasons I prefer outside because if I'm outside with the dog, even if I'm doing a fairly static shoot, mm -hmm. I will rarely have my shutter speed below a thousandth. Right. Because you know, you're right. That slight movement and dogs can turn their head and move, and they can lift a paw, or they can twitch an ear. Right. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you've got a ruined picture. And also, uh, I hate to say it, but you know, you need to be a bit of a machine gunner. Um, right. The, the, the various reasons and the, you know, uh, 10 frames a second is fine. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got a Canon uh, 7D Mark II or whatever, I think it shoots at about 20 frames a second. Mm -hmm on memory um anything 10 to 20 frames a second is usually okay but the point is that the dog will move fast and if you try and you know do the capture the one single moment you've got to be got an expert a real expert to be able to do that that'd be a marksman the rest of us, expert <laughs> exactly the rest of us will you know shoot three or four frames a right. little burst just to make sure that we bracket that moment where we want the dog to be looking at us uh, and the other thing is the dog's moving fast um the dog's jowls flap up and down mm -hmm. uh, you know it's it, all the skin on around its eyes move up and down right and it looks completely uh, awful <laughs> For, say nine <laughs> frames out of a 10 frame burst it looks like some monster from outer space come down and to suck your soul out uh but that one frame when perhaps all its flesh is in transition and it looks like a dog is the one frame you want to grab because right. that's the one where you think right it's it's running at full pelt it its face looks normal in fact it looks brilliant because mm -hmm. it looks engaged eyes staring Perhaps, uh, you know, all the feet off the ground as they do when yeah. they're running, they, they get all, even a little dog mm -hmm. will at some point when it's running have all four feet in the air. And if you're down low enough, you'll, you'll get air between it and the ground. Just looks fantastic. Oh. You know? and so you can get a little poodle, a little miniature poodle. You can, you can get it flying. Um, small dogs, big dogs, it, it happens to them all eventually. And that's what you want. I'm I'm going to work on it some more, but I'm definitely going to take a look at some some of your work and get some more tips from you. So I have probably about six or so images that I wanted to queue up and sure. ask you to walk through and share your insight on them because they're all fascinating to me for different reasons. Um, and I, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. You care I share these on the screen now? Absolutely. All right. So let's pull these up here. Let's see. Which button is it? Ant? Is it this button? Yay. I got the right button. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this one here, uh, I saw it in, of course, the vibrant red is the first thing that catches my eye, you know, because our eyes move to luminosity and to saturation when we're looking at images. It's just natural. Um, but it is beautifully done with the, I love just the, the standard you know, common pose of this dog walking. And then I looked at the eyes of the dog looking up at something um, like something got its attention, almost like, hmm, what is this? What's going on? What is that over there? And then there's this little soft reflection of the dog uh, right below it. It's just it's not distracting, but it just gives it another dimension to this image. Uh, can you walk us through just setting this shot up or uh, what was going on and, and you know, did you plan this or just was it, hey, I just saw it happen and boom, I'm going to catch it while he's in the action. Well, this was a slightly unusual uh, shoot. So um, I, as well as doing shoots for clients, I do shoots of working dogs. Okay. And this was a training day for working dogs. So uh, this particular dog is a scenting dog. Uh, so it is being taught to uh um, you know, hunt down a scent. Mm -hmm. uh, and these dogs use a variety of different training scents. Uh, so it'll, it might, might be a clove or some gun oil or something similar that it follows. And then uh, the I'll go around with the instructor. In this particular case, uh, the lovely Georgie of uh, K9 Brain Training. And um, she showed me where the hides were. So I had a good idea where the dog was going to go in each case, three or four hides uh, for each each sort of training session of, of 15, 20 minutes. And um, 
the owner is there to set the dog on the scent and uh, let it go. Uh, and in this case, I said to Georgie, um, you know, this is a particular good spot. So if w this was a flatbed lorry, Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd spotted that we were in a, uh, a a yard where there were lots of transport vehicles. Right. Uh, so some big lorries. So this the behind was a, a lorry with a big red uh, cover on it. And then uh, the, this flatbed was in front and it had been raining uh, for most of the day. So there was a lot of water everywhere. Nice reflection. And I got her to uh, start the dog at one end of the lorry. And I knew the scent was at the other end. So I just I just did like a, a walk down beside the dog, um, watching it as it went down there. And when it be showed an interest in the scent it was air scenting at this point mm -hmm. and I could see where it was going I thought well this is going to be fantastic as you say a lot of punch from that red background uh, it'll make a lovely publicity shot for yeah. the, uh, the person who who does the training as well as the owner it, it looks superb so that was a, a shot I was able to get and I was very pleased with that but equally so there were uh, it was a day of vibrant colors and a lot of reflection so I loved that day it became very important. So I, the setup of this and standard for me a thousand um, a thousandth of a second. Yeah. Uh, I always obviously shoot in servo, uh, and so it's right. important to you know have a small focus point as well. Um, so I go for the one of the smallest on that the camera will accept, which also remi means you've got a joystick that around to be in the right position so you frame well. Yeah, uh, and then um, uh, for uh, you know the f stop something that's acceptable uh i prefer to shoot with quite a narrow depth of field so that everything's thrown out of uh, focus behind wasn't too worried about this but i didn't want the uh, background to be too sharp so it distracted right. you know right. if there was right. a blemish or something on it i prefer it to be uh, a little bit out of focus yeah it's nice uh, having and then an extra I, separation there Absolutely, yeah. So it, the dog stands away from it. And then I let the ISO float. So I set the ISO to auto, and that controls my exposure for me. Nice. Uh, so I don't have to worry. I always shoot in manual, so I've got control of both speed and aperture. Uh, and the uh, floating ISO is just brilliant. When that facility came in, it stopped a lot of messing about with the camera settings yeah. as I was going along. Made yeah. life so much simpler. And then it was a matter of, you know, taking little bursts of shots as the dog moved along. Uh, and that was one of the best that came out. So I was delighted with that. Wow. It's absolutely beautiful. That there, that is, again, with the separation from the background, the beautiful, the beautiful red color there, and just the obvious story, just looking at this again, it just blows me away. But let's move on to this next shot here. A little bit different, a little bit change of pace, but at the same time, looking at some of the stuff that you mentioned earlier about being able to just let the dog go outside and let the dog just be a dog, this stuff starts to make sense to me now because I initially thought, okay, he probably had this dog just go sit over here in the brush and just pose and sit there. And I got a hunch that is not the case. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, if you have to, then you have to. But mm -hmm. uh, no, the idea is to try and track the dog, dog all the time. And uh, here's a hint. Tell your client to stay a couple of paces behind you mm -hmm. so that you've got a com complete freedom to uh, swing, you know, f through 180 degrees in the forward sector, as it were. Uh, so they never accidentally come into the shot just when you need it. Need mm -hmm. it. Uh, and try to let them just let the dog do what it was. Uh, what it wants. M most dogs won't go very far away uh, right. unless they're completely out of control. Most dogs <laughs> will range, you know, <laughs> 40 or 50 yards and then they'll come back and then they'll range out and some don't move more than 10 yards, which can actually be a problem because I generally shoot with big long lenses. So I ca carry two cameras. Uh, I have uh, my 100, 400 uh, on my fastest camera mm -hmm. and then on the slower camera um which is a you know um which is a uh, d5 mark 4 mm -hmm. um i have uh, a 7200 uh which that's still plenty you know, of length you know, on that though uh yeah it is it is but uh you know i i'm never really gonna 
or I very rarely shoot for the entire environment. Mm -hmm. I'm always, always uh, concentrating on the dog. And even if I've got a bit too much around it, I'll often crop in because, right. you know, the dog is the subject. Uh, and I, I really, really insist on having everything absolutely pin sharp. If there's a shot that is a little blurry, then it's going to go in the can. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't mind the nose being blurry because if I've got a depth of field of only a few inches mm -hmm. uh, and I'm focusing on the eyes, the eyes. Mm -hmm. then the, the nose might fall out of focus, which I don't mind at all right? Uh, because everyone looks at the eyes. right? So it's really important to uh, make sure that you have got that little pinpoint focus point or if you're lucky enough to have a, a new uh, mirrorless Canon with excellent eye tracking, mm -hmm. then it'll kind of do it for you, right? Uh, which is well, wonderful for an old man with failing eyesight. Uh, <laughs> Who you and, know. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's just a matter of waiting because eventually the dog will come, be coming towards you. And if it's in something like this, a, a, a nice bit of thick heather, uh, it'll pop its head up and, and look around for you. And that's, to me, uh, as good as a, a portrait shot in a studio, but so much better because the dog's in its natural environment. It's not doing anything. It's doesn't want to do its ears are in the beautiful alert position mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's not it's not being taught it's not being told what to do mm -hmm. uh you know it's it's right there uh and it's looking for something uh and you've caught it in the act and it just creates just such a lovely picture get that lovely bokeh from the background mm -hmm. out of focus and um you know when you get a few like that then you think ah yeah that really worked well you know, and I appreciate you making my job a little bit easier because I was going to ask, what were you shooting this with because of this beautiful shallow depth of field? And I was like, he's got to be shooting something with a long focal length on it. But you mentioned the one to 400 as well as the 70 to 200. So perfect. Yeah. Uh, perfect, I, perfect. I, if I can, I prefer the 70 200 because you has got to, you know, you can get the S top down to 2.8, mm -hmm. which even narrows it even more. Mm -hmm. You've got to be so careful with your focus though, when you're out at 200 mil and you've got that uh, tiny, uh, ap or, uh, sorry, that very large aperture. Mm -hmm. So that tiny depth of field, mm -hmm. uh, because if you make one little mistake, then, you know, it, you've ruined it. What could have been a great shot. And I tell you what, if my eyes were cameras, I'd have, the best pictures in the world because the number of times you know you see an image every photographer on the planet <laughs> absolutely but you're a millisecond from getting your camera up mm -hmm. uh and that's the reasons i've got quite big biceps because <laughs> you know you can never really afford to take the camera away from your face you nope. you you're like a sniper right. and the moment you see a shot you've got to be up there ready with all the settings perfect which means all the way uh, you're walking around, you're thinking about where the light's coming from. Mm -hmm. Do I need to adjust things a little bit to get a little bit more light? Mm -hmm. um, do I need to change my uh, focus uh, point here? Do I need to move it to the top of the screen, the bottom of the screen? Where's the dog going to come from? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and just as a general rule, um, don't try and frame him too close. Give yourself a little bit of room. I could show you a whole portfolio of pictures of headless dogs <laughs> where, where they, they've done absolutely, you know, a fantastic leap. Mm. And I've just been a millisecond behind them and they've jumped out of the frame. Oh. And you think to yourself, oh, that would have been superb. <laughs> but I couldn't quite match the speed of movement. And, uh, you know, you think to yourself, oh, I don't damn, know. Maybe damn, you could damn. turn those into some sort of weird memes or something. I don't know. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I certainly could. Yeah, it'd be a, a good one for a Christmas show. But yeah, exactly right. <laughs> Uh, but stuff. don't forget that there's a fair amount that goes on post as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'll, I'll come back and I'll, I, I, I won't show my pictures to the client mm -hmm. because I know they're going to look so much better once I get back on the computer and work on them for a while. Right. Right. I love this. This has this whole painterly effect going to it. It's just beautifully done uh, from the capture yeah. down to the post process and just uh, black beautiful. dogs. Uh, people say, oh, I can't photograph my dog because it's black. Mm -hmm. You know, you, in fact, if you if you get the contrast right and you, you get the uh, the sharpness of the image yep. and you get the light right, uh, it, you bring up the bit, little bits of reflection on the black fur. Yep. The specular it really highlights. does. 
<laughs> Absolutely, you can you can get that definition that you want out of black fur. Whereas, you know, a, a, a cheaper camera or perhaps someone without the ability to do good post processing mm -hmm. will end up with a black blob or or a white blob. Yeah, so I've seen it with white hard. fur too. It, it's it's hard to yeah. get a good bit of detail with white fur um, oh, unless that light is uh, just right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have. I, you know, I, I love photographing in bright sun because I can use a, a very high speed without worrying about it. Mm. But actually, a slightly overcast day is often better for me because right. it stops those hard shadows yep. that uh, conceal so much. It's natural diffusion. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. All right. So let's take a look at another shot here. Ah, I'm, I'm going to take you off the screen for half a second just so everybody can see it in its glory. Man, this one, Nick, this, this is, I love a beautiful landscape. I love having just the beautiful sunlight, just peeking in with beautiful sun rays. And then the cherry on the top is the dog running in the distance, coming towards the camera with a big stick in its mouth that just says, I am the happiest daggum animal on the planet right now. Uh, this scene just it, it really hit me in the heart and just stopped me in my tracks. Absolutely beautiful. I want to hear the setup. I want to hear your thoughts on um, post processing and the dog. I, I want to hear it all on this one. This 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 is the one, sir. So please tell me what what went into this. Well, you, whenever you're going around, you're concentrating on the dog, on, on what it's doing, trying to get those shots. But you've always got to have a, a little bit of your brain there mm -hmm. looking for uh, a bit of a landscaper. Perhaps to the top of a hill, you can see some misty hills in the background. Somewhere, pardon me, where you will get a great background. Mm -hmm. uh, no one just wants a picture of their dog. If you can get a beautiful background, whether it be... You know the beautiful blue seats of a auditorium mm -hmm. that I photographed in, mm -hmm. or a fantastic landscape. Um, you must never forget that that you know, the dog is only part of the picture. The rest of the picture must be eye pleasing. And we came around the corner, and I saw the sun coming through the edge of the forest. And it's never easy when you're photographing um, through patches of light. Because if you get the timing wrong, the dog will be in the shadow and mm -hmm. it won't even be worth looking at. And if the dog's running fast, it's only going to be in that patch of light for, for a, you know, half a second. Right. So you, you've, you've got to get it right. And uh, when I saw the, the light, I said to the owner, any chance that you could get the dog to run up and down that path a bit? Uh, and they said, yeah, sure. Uh, so they the owner stood at one end of the path and the wife at the other and they just called the dog as, and the dog ran between them so i, I it wasn't much use uh, when it was running uh, right to uh left to right sorry because that was back end to me but when it came right to left and came towards the light a couple of times it dodged the light and ran through that patch of shadow so that wasn't much good <laughs> so we did it a couple of times and um i'm gonna say something for for all dog owners uh, you should never throw sticks for your dog uh, the number of dogs that are really badly injured uh when they try and grab a stick and it, it they get it wrong and it it goes in and damages the back of their mouth or their throat. Right. Uh, it, it's just not worth doing. If you're going to throw something for your dog, it should always be something that's soft, uh, you know, preferably a, a, a proper rubberized toy or whatever. But right. this dog picked up that branch on its own because it just loves branches. Right. <laughs> and as it came into that patch of light, that was probably about the second in a little burst. Uh, and the next couple, actually, the dog's legs were just looking a bit unnatural. Um, because you know, you, not every moment is the dog looking completely like a dog. You know, like sometimes mm -hmm. it's got a leg sticking out at a funny angle, <laughs> and you think, "Oh, that doesn't look quite right." But that that one image, I thought, just captured it nicely. And um, then, of course, when you get it back home, you think, "I wonder if I can just make that work even better." Mm -hmm. So. The dog's silhouetted, obviously, so you had to highlight the uh, the body of the dog, which mm -hmm. I did carefully, um, and then the, the the light rays coming down through the trees were obvious, but I wanted them to be really obvious. Right. So I I manipulated uh, using a brush. I I uh, 
lightened the rays, the, the areas, mm -hmm. very carefully, and I darkened the gaps in between just to emphasize mm -hmm. the difference between the shadow and the light. Oh, I know I that didn't technique need to do very much well. Else. <laughs> You're very good. Didn't need to do much else, just a, a little bit of uh, saturation uh, increase on the leaves at the bottom, uh, just so that, you know, we, we can tell it's autumn. Uh, the, some leaves are still turning, so there's a nice bit of green there, but a lot of leaves have fallen. Uh, and apart from that, the, the shot just made itself. It, then it's just a matter of proportions. Uh, I couldn't get the dog um, at the either of the thirds on the left or right, but I could get him the third on the bottom. So mm -hmm. that, that was my aim, and to give enough space above to be able to see those beautiful uh, light rays coming through. I mean, it, the, the image also has atmosphere in it as well. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of smoky and it's nice. It uh, was quite an early morning. There was a lot of frost around. Right. Uh, and uh, as the, the day warmed up, all that frost starts to melt mm -hmm. and turns into wisps of steam, uh, which is what that mistiness is. And, uh, you know, it looks, it looks kind of fairyland magical. And you, not, not often you get out and it's a lovely day like that. You'll, you'll come back to the same spot yep. the next day and it'll look completely bland. But oh, today you're lucky, you know. Absolutely Hopefully, if you can get beautiful. one shot out of a shoot that is special like that, then you've done well. Absolutely beautiful, man, man. Captain Nick, Whew. dude, this this was beautiful work. Beautiful, just uh, I'm blown away. I, I knew you were good, and just seeing more <laughs> and more of these images, it's just like wow, man. He's 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 crushing it. Just. I really, really do appreciate you hanging out with me today and, and, and going through sharing the, the nuance in shooting pet photography. It, it's, it's, it's not as simple as pick up the camera and shoot. There is a little bit of thought process to it that that tends to go a really, really long way. But before we get out of here. I want to offer you the opportunity to share anything that you'd like to plug, maybe a particular podcast that I listen to every single <laughs> week. Um, that's my one of my favorites. Um, is there anything that I you'd like to I share and plug? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, uh, um, for those who don't know, my aviation background has drawn me into podcasting uh, and in particular with the Airline Pilot Guy show. So... Uh, uh, if you have the vaguest interest in uh, aviation, either as a pilot or a passenger, or just you, you like watching airplanes, then uh, have a listen. Uh, pop across to airlinepilotguide.com to find uh, the website there. And I'm a co-host on that every week. It's weekly shows. It's a long show. It's uh, you know close on three hours, and we cover all sorts of things. And I do a little special uh, excerpt during that show where I cover a, a subject in aviation history that interests me. Uh, and uh, we've got a great team. Uh, so Captain Jeff, a, a, a very experienced captain on a legacy uh, airline. We've got uh, Captain Rick, who is a freight dog and travels all around the world long haul. We've got Dr. Steph, who is the uh, most lovely co-host you'd ever imagine a terribly um enthusiastic uh, lady <laughs> who uh who's a, a back doctor but when she's not doing that she's running marathons she's um jumping out of airplanes a skydiver uh, oh she's flying airplanes. i was gonna say she's uh, also then, dumping people out of airplanes absolutely yeah <laughs> really really good she's uh just uh, recently got her twin otter um ticket so now she's uh, flying you know twin engine uh, great airplanes and she's a fantastic character to have on and does all our aviation medicine stuff as well so the great team and not forgetting the lovely liz who is our producer who lives up in canada and does a lot of work in the background like all good producers do uh, to make sure the show runs on rail so that's that's you know my main interest when it comes to podcasting is uh, is doing that uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, for those listeners in the United Kingdom, although I have done photo shoots in Hong Kong, uh, Los Angeles, Detroit, uh, you know, places all around the world um, in the United Kingdom, if uh, you're interested in a, in a dog shoot and live in the south of England, then pop over to Nick Anderson Photo uh, co uk, and uh, you'll find uh, some information about me. That's just awesome. 
this this I love the show and you mentioned the plain tales. Probably one of my favorite plain tales was uh the crew she was she got on the the PA and was meaning to to mention it to the to the rest of the crew but it went out to everybody and she called everybody <laughs> about feeding the feeding the cattle or something like that she said. <laughs> Oh, yes, that was the, the infamous, <laughs> uh, an infamous, uh, this very senior lady who was uh, one of our cabin crew who was trying to get the rest of the cabin crew up from the bunks because they'd been on a crew rest. <laughs> and uh, she thought she was doing a PA down to the bunk area and uh, shouted down, um, wake up, you effers, the cattle need feeding. <laughs> And little did she know, but that announcement went out to the entire echo. <laughs> and realizing she was in danger of losing her job, she thought for a second, and then with, you know, ability that is well beyond me, she pressed the key again and in a much posher voice said, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to remind you that the announcement system can only be used by the cabin crew. <laughs> Such a good save. Such oh, a good yeah. save. Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. Captain yeah. Nick, thank you again for joining me. This has been just great. And I'm going to go ahead and ask you right here on air. Can I have you back on the show again in the future? Oh, absolutely. I'm retired. I've got nothing to do. <laughs> but uh, drink beer and enjoy myself. And this has been great fun. So thank you very much indeed. Anne. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right, folks, that is going to do it for this week's episode. Man, lots and lots of information. Thank you all for joining me here on the network each and every week. Again, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, you can shoot me a message the old school way via email. That is hop at twit.tv. Again, that's hop at twit.tv for your feedback, comments, image critiques, all that good stuff. I love going through those messages and I do answer them all at some point. Or just feel free to give me a follow on all the social medias. Well, not all of them. I just do two in particular. Follow me at Ant underscore Pruitt on Twitter. I'm also Ant underscore Pruitt over on Instagram. I, uh, as a matter of fact, I just recently did a show from um, some Instagram feedback. And uh, yeah, so you never know. We might even feature your uh, content and uh, feedback there. So give me a shout. And again, um, if you have any other questions, again, just reach out to all of us here at the network. Just subscribe to our shows, twit.tv slash hop, twit.tv slash H-O-P, and you can leave feedback there as well. All right, folks, I'm going to get out of here. Thank you again to my man, Mr. Victor, making me look and sound good. And, and you know, he worked so hard on this show. My, yeah, my. he's got quite a job to do there, hasn't he? <laughs> hey, you stay out of this, sir. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks, that's going to do it for us. You all take care and safely create and dominate. And we'll see you next time. No ads, just the content. That's what you get when you join Club Twit. You even get extras like Twit Plus, our new bonus feed just for members, and exclusive access to the Club Twit Discord community. Join now for just $7 a month and support Twit as we continue to create top-notch podcasts you expect and deserve. We're just getting started, so be one of the first to join as we build Club Twit from the ground up. You could be an early member. Go to twit.tv slash club twit to learn more and sign up now. Thanks. Thanks.